GPS, hey, we're all familiar with them. We use them every day. If your vehicle is telling you turn right, turn left, it's because it's accessing information off a global positioning satellite and is going to be able to tell you where you are and when you need to turn right, turn left. Well, use of the GPS to track down bad guys. How about that? Well, we've talked about that previously, but now what happens after the law has changed? What happens to investigation that was done before the law changed? And what I'm talking about is the U.S. Supreme Court has now decided that if the police are going to use a GPS device that they attach to a suspect's automobile, they need to get a search warrant. Well, in this week's case, we have a situation that occurred before that U.S. Supreme Court decision that we've talked about here on this video blog. And the police found information that then later was going to be used, or at least the prosecutor wanted to use, in a case against an alleged drug trafficker. All right. Well, the guy who's being accused of the crime said, no, you can't bring in that information dealing with where I went, how long I stayed there, people that I saw, et cetera, that was obtained using a GPS. You can't use that because the U.S. Supreme Court has now said that a GPS can only be used on a suspect's vehicle if there is a search warrant, and here there was not a search warrant. Well, the case went up on appeal, went up to an appellate court. The appellate court had to consider this. What are we going to do here? We've got this argument. The law has changed. The police cannot use evidence that is obtained illawfully from a GPS. And it's illawful if the evidence was obtained without a search warrant. On the other side, we've got the police who argue, hey, you know what? At the time we engaged in this investigation, it was lawful for us to use a GPS. We did it pursuant to the book. We did everything we were supposed to do. We dotted our I's, crossed our T's, and the evidence that we obtained is evidence we can't get now. I mean, the guy has been accused. He's been charged. He's now being tried, or we hope to get him tried. And if we can't use this evidence, our case is basically shot, and we can't go back and get that evidence again. It's unlikely this guy is going to do the same thing. So we think we should be able to use it because we in good faith did in fact get the evidence in a way that was allowed at that time we got it. So what should the court do here? What should the court do? Ev evidence is being offered and under one approach, U.S. Supreme Court, it will be excluded. Under the other approach, it would be admitted. So the court looked at this and said, you know what? Yes, we all recognize the U.S. Supreme Court has decided this case, at least the case dealing with the GPS, and has decided you need a search warrant. But you know, these guys, the police, did act in good faith when they engaged in the use of the GPS when they did. They did it pursuant to the law, and we, the appellate court, are going to find that since they acted in good faith, the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule or unlawful search and seizure applies. And at trial, the evidence was brought in against the accused. All right, so what do we learn from this? What do we learn from this? We learn that the law needs to be adaptive. It needs to be able to deal with situations that can't always be considered. And in this instance, now this is not that terribly unusual, the law may change from the time the original facts came into existence to the time the case gets to trial. Often it takes as much as two years for a case to get to trial. And when that happens, as we see in this instance, a court will many times apply the law which existed at the time the facts came into existence. Now, there has to be compelling reasons to have that happen, and in this instance, when we're dealing with criminal law, there has to be a very compelling reason the court found that by virtue of the fact they, as they police pointed out they weren't able to replicate that evidence again, and therefore, since they acted in good faith, the court said the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule to unlawful search and seizure does apply. Okay, so we learned something here today, something you may not have been aware of previously. We bring you these videos, as you know, every week, so you understand how the law works. I'm David Allen.